space is bigger than earth. And what I'm saying is space is a force unto itself to inspire people to want to go into sciences in the first place. This is Generation Space. In this episode, we continue our conversation with Dr. Neil deGrasse Tyson and former astronaut, Colonel Jack Two Fish Fisher. So yeah. we're, we're talking about the future. So like, I'm, I'm curious, like, uh, so our show, Generation Space, you know, it's one of the Can they see that with your head in the way? Yeah. With the side camera. Did no. my co-workers tell you to say that? I don't, I'm Saul's not that big-headed. Saul's head's the A. Where we go? Uh, okay. it's, it's on someone's water bottle, maybe yours. Okay, there, I got one. There we go. Yeah. There we go. Oh, yeah, yeah, uh, I saw yeah. that. There we go. I got our sticker on there. Very but, cool. Like, I love it. Yeah. But like, so, but when I think about Generation Space 2, it's like, you know, we have the different generations, Generation X, this and that, but it's like, baby, it's my mom and dad's, it's the baby boomers, boomers, but then it's like the 13-year-old walking to school, listen to a Neil deGrasse Tyson podcast. Um, it's one of the few generations. Or this that, podcast. Or this podcast. Yeah. Hey, <laughs> that good, that, yeah, that good, that go. good. Yeah, that's nice. Yeah, uh, product placement and everything. Um, but um, so when, when we think about the, um, you know, 2060, and we think about what could be, um, what, so like, what are some of the things when you're talking to kids, when you're talking to STEM audiences, what do you tell them to not just be the 20 percent pessimistic, but like, what do you, what, what gets you going? What gets you excited for? I, I what's have a, possible. I have a, a slightly more sort of uh, uh, nuanced way that this can all unfold. And this takes longer than an elevator ride. So the the elevator pitch, Mm -hmm. okay, let's go into a tall building. (laughs) Give me a little more time on the elevator. Get a couple floors. (laughs) Add a few more floors to that elevator ride, not just in the the five-story Rayburn office building, right, in Washington (laughs) or however many stories it is. It's not a high rise. So I'd want lawmakers to sit down for a little longer than an elevator ride and hear this pitch. Um, There is no force as powerful on our hearts and minds as dreams of space. And I say this not as an astrophysicist. I say this as a citizen of a country that has at one time and continues to value innovation and what role that plays in exploration. Forget the motivations for it for the moment. The fact is... When we discover a black hole or a new planet or there's an eclipse, it is headlines Mm -hmm. all over. It's it's headlines. I don't twist arms and make it headlines. It's headlines because everybody looks up and everybody wonders, who am I? What is my place in this universe? Mm -hmm. And (laughs) here's the best example I can give. Let's say you're a kid. Uh, You're an oceanographer. Okay. And I'm an astrophysicist. Uh, more accurate for me to be a kid, but we, let's okay. go with oceanographer. No, no, right, right. You're an oceanographer. <laughs> I'm an astrophysicist. And you're pick any other, you're a biologist, okay? Okay. And we go in and there's a classroom of eighth graders. And we're trying to get them interested in STEM fields, okay? So you say, hey, there's still species of life we have yet to discover on Earth. Uh, we don't know. And the ecosystem is in a, and you give a really good pitch, okay? They don't care. Wait a minute. <laughs> you, uh, you know, we've hardly been to the depths of the Marianas Trench, and there's life forms down there that don't involve sunlight, and they can still get around, and they eat, and, we, and the ocean, we're still mapping the bottom of the ocean, and there's vessels that are much more dangerous than a spaceship, because they can implode, and you'll die, but it's really cool, okay? Then there's a geologist that says, um, I'm specialized in volcanoes, and I descend into the caldera of a volcano, and this is a volcano that took out Pompeii. And so who's with everybody gives their pitch? So the kids are, now I walk in, okay? Um, the planet Mars has the largest known volcano in the solar system. There might be life thriving in aquifers beneath the surface. We don't yet know. Who's with me to explore Mars for life? And I win that conversation every single time because space is bigger than Earth. And what I'm saying is space is a force unto itself to inspire people to want to go into sciences in the first place. And this is not my imagination. This is real. So if you inspire a generation to go into STEM fields, these are the fields that assure a thriving economy in the future because the growth economies of the future will pivot on innovations in science and technology that feed them. So I'd say let's go into space 
Yes, because it's fun and it's amazing and it's in our DNA, but I know deep down that's not why anyone will write the check. Let's go into space because if you do, you will infuse our culture with an attitude and, an, and a perspective and a, and a desire to want to be part of that enterprise. And they will become scientists, technologists, mathematicians. And if they don't, they'll become other professions that'll still matter in that field. Oh, you want to be an attorney? What are the land rights on, Mar on the moon? Who owns the moon? Who owns this asteroid? It says, we need some laws surrounding that. Suppose you meet an alien and you kill it. Is that murder? It's, is it murder if they're less intelligent than you? Is there murder if it's... A, so there are other uh, walks of life. Medicine. We need... We want to keep you alive. Food. What food are you going to eat two years down the line? Agriculture. Are you going to grow food when you get to Mars? It's all there. So I would say a vibrant space program led by the government making the first investment where then private enterprise can and often does take it up afterwards when the when the risks are quantified, will completely transform not only our country, but all of civilization. Because science literacy will be a fundamental part of what it is to be a participant in our civilization. And today, I don't see that. Science literate people are science literate and other people are rejecting science. What's that about? What, do you wanna move back into the cave tomorrow? What are you doing? So. So that spiel that I just gave, I could probably tighten it to half that length, but it's still longer than an elevator ride. And today, we have programs to try to get people interested in science. Why do you have programs trying to get people interested? Because there's nothing out there that's otherwise attracting them. When the government does something like, let's go to Mars with astronauts, it makes headlines every week. Here's the new challenge. Oh, we need people to help us prevent us from radiation. Oh, I'm an engineer. I got a solution for that. Oh, we need food three years down the line. How are you going to do that? I've got a way to grow food on Mars. All of a sudden, innovation becomes fun, not the requirement of some government program just to increase those numbers. You didn't need programs in the 1960s to stimulate interest in science. Apollo was doing that. I was going to say for free. No, but Apollo costs money. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> Apollo was doing that. You didn't need a separate program. People wanted to become science teachers who were science literate. Yeah. It's a culture that we would lead to. It is. I, and I'm not going to skeptify what you said. No! I'm going to amplify what you said. <laughs> Boom. There it went. Boom. Um, you <laughs> fist bump on skeptify. <laughs> but I'm going to use another, another saying for you New, New Yorker folks. Uh, it's man. like a self-licking ice cream cone. You, you do great things, you inspire kids to do STEM, they do more great things, you, d you inspire more kids. It is a multi-generational effort, it has to be. And uh, when, I, when I was applying for the astronaut program, I was in the F-22 squadron, greatest fighter ever made. And I asked who was inspired by Apollo. Every single person in the room raised their hand. They're all in their 50s um, and they created that. So those great things come from the inspiration. But I do think that we are Unlike b before, <laughs> I got to keep going it's back to it. It's different this it's time. Different it's different this, this time, time. baby, <laughs> because <laughs> we are seeding industry. The X Prize seeded a commercial space tourism industry. I can't even imagine getting you to see space. And with your ability, like Shakespeare, to explain that to everyone, I have a friend who's an author, Patricia Cornwell. I know Patricia, yes. And... and, and if she could see it. Nobody if, doesn't love Patricia Cornwell. She's oh great. Oh, my God. Love the lady. <laughs> yeah. But and if her, you, her latest novel is, is in space. It is? Yes. I mean, has it, is it out yet? It, it comes out uh, 1 October. Okay. So, oh, oh, so he, and, he's got the inside yeah, track. Man, yeah, 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 yeah. Get it out. out. Coming up. This is like a murder in space or something. It, yeah. It's a James Bond And she space cares, she cares about facts. She and, does. Well, okay. Yeah, yeah. But imagine A scientifically literate novelist. Or you or... All of these people going for a space flight, a, a Blue Origin or a Virgin Galactic, and then coming back and sharing that with the world. Little sparks catching an inspirational wildfire all over the planet to get another way. Because, yes, the truly hard, amazing, almost impossible things inspire you at a different level. But uh, being a friend of the Onizuka family and going to Challenger Centers all over... Mm. Um, Ellison Onizuka from Challenger, yeah. Yep, yeah. and uh, it's 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 a uh, you know I I I can inspire kids by 
showing them about capillary action and almost drowning myself with my Kool-Aid. You know, you can, you can inspire kids by showing them things that don't even make sense, that open their mind a little bit. The things that open their mind wide open, that's hugely inspirational. That's lifetime inspirational. But you can get them down the path with even the little stuff. And so the more, f the more ways that we come at the same problem, another seeding of industry, commercial crew program. We paid them to design it for us. They thought there was going to be a, you know, uh, economy, economic reason on the other side. So they're engaged. And now we're going to have a huge foundation of capability to get folks to orbit as opposed to what we would have had. Well, we've been working on that for 20 years. Consider commercial 20... crew programs, not 20 no, I'm years old. No, I'm old. talking about I'm, I'm talking about the intent to have commercial uh, tourism. Okay, that's been that's been on the table for at tourism least two is decades. One thing. Commercial crew no, you, program you is, you, is I'm, dragon I'm, space. I'm going to, okay, okay, I'm just saying. You, right. you mentioned it. I'm just taking them one by one. I'm going to skeptify you. So for our go. audience members who are just listening to this, I'm, stand, I'm sitting between both of them. I am a little fearful for my life. But keep, keep, keep going. <laughs> There's a whole thing. <laughs> like, Dr. Tyson's a, kind of a tall guy. I didn't realize how tall he was. You're, you're kind of on your own, sir. <laughs> so so um, uh, tourism, that's been in sort of a very obvious, important first attempt to get non-tax-based monies feeding space activities. You bet. Okay? No doubt about it. It's been two decades. Um, and whereas in 1960, we went from no spacecraft that can carry humans to nine years later, putting humans on the moon. And it's been 20 years, and we have yet to have a viable commercial um, tourism industry, in part because we can do the vomit comet Suborbital, we got that. Orbital, that is not a, that's not a simple extension of going suborbital. That is a whole other design of spacecraft with heat shields. And, and excuse me, don't say, oh, we're having suborbital right now, and then if, and soon we'll go in orbit. I, I don't see that anytime soon. The risk and the costs. The no, sorry. CST no, it'll be for millionaires. And... It's a millionaire ride. Okay. It, it's for millionaires. And... Sorry, it's for billionaires who can spend a million dollars, okay. not for millionaires who can spend fifty thousand dollars or a hundred thousand. It'll cost way more than a hundred thousand dollars. So here's a way you could do that: you can have a lottery. I put in a dollar to go orbital, and you get three hundred million people doing it every week. Um, that pays for that person to go on. You could do Sounds that. Great. You could do that. Um, but I'm just saying the progress in that has been slow, and uh, so that feeds my skepticism that it's going to happen any time soon. You mean like, I don't know, October next 50 6th years. when we have the OFT for CST 100? Well, I'm just saying, if you, you can have someone fork up $10 million to ride, I, but they're one-offs at that point. They're, they're like, sure, they're test cases for whether this might be something in the future. I don't have a problem with that. I'm just saying that the cost remains prohibitively high for tourism and I something else needs to take place that hasn't taken place yet that I, I'm not I'd, I'd rather keep my enthusiasm in a sort of reality zone and but but that being said I'm glad folks like you exist and Elon Musk we need people who are ready to just Walk off the edge. Hold my beer. Watch this. <laughs> exactly. Hurry up, hurry up. I like that. See, he's got an expression. <laughs> See, yeah. Jersey. We, we, got <laughs> we got an expression. Hold my beer. Watch this. I love that. There we go. There we go. That's a good one. He didn't like any of mine. <laughs> I, I, I got All the right, start. Right. What town in Texas are you from? I, I'm not from Texas. Oh. My mom is from Texas. Wait, what town is she from? Uh, all over, but mm -hmm. Uvalde. Yeah, okay. It was where it started, Sabinel. All right. All uh, right, so uh, there's a four-star journal who wants to talk to you in a uh -oh. few minutes, and I'm already keeping you kind of late. Does he outrank uh, so. both of y'all? Yes. <laughs> Is that how that works? A lot. Okay, by a lot. Yeah. <laughs> Not by a little bit, but so by a lot. I can't keep you too much longer, but uh, so we'll just do two kind of like final questions. Yeah, we'll sure. start to wrap it up. Sure. Uh, so uh, we'll go real quick. Okay, my, my colonel's sweating a little bit, but we'll, we'll knock this out over there. Uh, so uh, one, starry night. I like this tattoo, or I, I like this uh, tie here. Uh, what, what's the? I've heard you talk a little bit about it. What's the one thing you love most about Starry Night? Because I know you have multiple ties. You have cufflinks, I hear. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You have I, a sweater. I have about 120 
uh, cosmically inspired ties. And none of, only a few of them are representational. The rest are some artistic interpretation of space, which I prefer. So, so uh, one of my representative ones is a uh, Saturn V rocket, which is where it fits, it's vertical, there we go. it works, it works. <laughs> so Starry Night, if you look at it, it's like, what was going on in this guy's head? What, what the? But what I like about it is a couple of things. It's not what he saw, it's what he felt. And I like tracking what people feel because that emotions drive actions. Emotions drive motivation. Emotions Inspiration. are what make us human. And I value that. Plus, my brother's an artist. So I have certain sensitivities to that that are just from family. In addition, I think it's the first painting ever to be named for what was drawn in the background. Not in the foreground. Not right. The, they could have named it Sleepy Village, Cypress Tree, Rolling Hills. No. Yeah. It's named The Starry Night. And I don't know of another painting that has a foreground, midground, background, and the name of the painting is the background. And this was 1889, very late. So for me, as an astrophysicist, it was the dawn of an era where people are turning the universe into the subject. Rather than the wallpaper of what is otherwise their object of interest. Yeah, that's great. I love, I love when so, you know a thousand people can look at something and take, have different takeaways. And uh, yeah, that's. Those. I think the best art is you can personalize what you see. Right. If you if you can't personalize what you see, the artist didn't give you room to take ownership of that moment you had with their creation. Yeah, fantastic. And uh, so this is the last question, and I always ask this, uh, for, you know, just about every interview I do. Okay. Uh, so uh, I'll, I'll, I'll let you think about it, Dr. Tyson. I'll, I'll ask Colonel Fisher first. Uh -oh. There we go. Um, so real simple, what do you live your life by? What's your your theme song, your mantra, your uh, this is this is my compass here? Okay. Uh, last thing my dad uh, said to me uh, when he died was I'd, uh, I was going to leave the academy, come home, help run the construction company. He said, no way, heads are who's been in the stars, I dare you to dream. And that is, it's, uh, it's two components, opening your mind to what's possible and working hard to get there. And I think what's important to me right now and, and my airmen and, and the airmen of uh, United States Space Command is that we need to set the table. Whatever future is, whatever, whether it's skeptified or amplified, whatever, Wherever we're going to go, we have to defend that domain today, deter a conflict, or we're not going to be able to set the table for whatever's coming. And uh, our guys need to work hard and dream of how we're going to do that uh, or nothing beyond this is going to happen, whether it's Mars, whatever it is. So dare to dream, and uh, you can... Put that on any epic you want, but for now and for us, it's most important today. Yeah, yeah you, you you went quite literal with uh, your dad's words. You know, your head's always been the stars, and you lived in the stars. I mean, hey, like, baby. Yeah, you are kind of hanging out with him a little bit up there. Who knows, right? Who knows? So how about you, Dr. Tyson? Well, as an astrophysicist, low Earth orbit is still far away from the stars. I just want to make that clear. All right, I'm out. <laughs> Later, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> no, what people don't know is if you take a, a globe, a schoolroom globe of the Earth and ask, where is the space station? How far away? People usually stick their hand out far, but it's it's three eighths of an inch above the surface. So as an astrophysicist, I was never really attracted to Apollo or the space program because they were not going far away enough for me. Because I cared about stars and galaxies and the Big Bang and the universe. Right, right. Um, but it's sufficient to excite people, and that's all that really mattered there. Um, I, I just want to comment that what you said, while you're applying it to the here and now, I agree with you that it's a timeless. It's a timeless mission. You could say that at any time, and it would be true. Mm -hmm. you, but you, you in the here and now are applying it in the here and now, and that's a great, it's a great sentiment. Uh, for me, I, I just want to make sure I learn something new every day so that I continue to be a lifelong learner. School was not my education. It was the beginning of my education. And not to sound cliche, but you attend a commencement. Commencement means the beginning, not the end. But most people think of it as the end. And they stop learning, and then they ossify in life. As long as you keep learning, more opportunities get noticed. The capacity to solve greater and greater problems um, grows. 
So I want to learn something new every day. And also take a little bit of my life each day to lessen the suffering of others. Both my parents were, father was active in the civil rights movement. My mother became a, a gerontologist. So I lived in a household where concern and caring for others was fundamental to a life's mission. And here's their son, the astrophysicist. So how do I fulfill that? It doesn't take much, you know, help someone across the street. You, I mean, it does just little trifling little bits of your day, which is hardly any investment, really. If it can make another person's day, lessen their suffering. If everyone did that, just the amount of love that would be sort of infused into the world could be transformative. Absolutely. And so I, I try to do that every day. If, even if it's to tell a fun joke or to just make someone smile, add a little goodness oh, into the brain. world. That's great. That's those two things drive me every day that I wake up. Those are, those are good motivating, motivating yeah. thoughts. That's yeah, great. Those are awesome. <laughs> no, I'm not doing it. Not doing it. <laughs> <laughs> Get behind me, Satan. <laughs> and by the way, I'm, I'm delighted that you guys are out there protecting my freedoms to make that happen. So uh, all too often it's taken for granted uh, that you could, by the way, I, I know you're running out of time. Yeah. This book? Yep. Yes, sir. Okay. Accessory, not ancestry. No, not ancestry. <laughs> uh, this book was ready to be translated into Chinese. And I got a notice back from the, the China uh, publishing house. Uh, we, fine, we look forward to translating it, but um, we want to delete these following passages. Delete? Why? Oh, they mention China in some way that's not entirely flowery. Some of them were even just neutral. Nope, can't do it. And I said, well, there's a billion people plus in China. So, uh, you know, uh, it, it, I can make a financial decision and say, okay, do it so we can still sell the book. But then I realized this would not be an edited version. It would be an expurgated version. These are two different things. Edited is we got to shorten it up. Let's nip and tuck. If you're actually cutting things out so that the reader doesn't know what you wanted to write, mm -hmm. That's an expurgation. And I was reminded that we really are free here in the United States. As much as I like complaining how often I have to show my ID moving in and out of establishments, um, show your papers. We don't call them papers. Show your ID. But in the, during the Cold War, where are your papers? You know, yeah. you can't move around without showing your papers. As much as I complain about that, how much I take for granted that I can read what I want. I could read salacious things. I could read loving things. The freedom to communicate is something that not everyone in this world has and something that is in our first frickin' amendment. So um, I just became a little patriotic there. Uh -huh. And I said, no, you are not translating this book. <laughs> So it does not exist in Chinese. No, no. they're lost. For that reason. They're lost. Mic drop. Mic drop. There we the go. Book drop. <laughs> no, I didn't mean to get all political here. No, but is that allowed? no, absolutely. No, is that I, I think so. I, I got yeah. me going. I'm excited. Yeah. I'm amped up. Okay. Well, uh, so, gentlemen, thank you so much for taking the time for being on our show. Um, I think every podcast is special. This one uh, was uh, no different than that. So, very special. Thank you for taking the time, both of you, to. Well, if we're no different, that meant this was an ordinary podcast for you. Well, you know, uh, what's, awesome. what's the phrase? <laughs> it's it's <laughs> awesome. Seriously. What's the name of that book? teed it up for you. It's, <laughs> it's awesome. If there every if anything is awesome, then nothing is awesome. There you go. Hey, the Lego song <laughs> says. All right. Well, that's it for this uh, episode of Generation Space. I hope you had as much fun as we did here today. Uh, and duck so people can read the poster. There we go. Generation there we go. Space. Okay, there you go. It's over there because I have a big head. All right. That's it. Thanks for joining us, everybody. Take care. Generation Space is a production of Air Force Space Command Public Affairs. Don't forget to check out our other episodes available on YouTube, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, and SoundCloud. You can also subscribe to get all of our future content. All right, don't let your big head lock the sign. Uh, <laughs> Should I go over on that side? Turn the light on. I'll go over here. The views and opinions expressed or implied in this podcast are those of the participants and should not be construed as carrying the official sanction of the Department of Defense, Air Force, U.S. Space Command, Air Force Space Command, or other agencies or departments of the U.S. government.